have a lot of passion for what you're doing. This rings true because it's so hard that if you don't, any rational person would give up. It's really hard, and you have to do it over a sustained period of time. So if you don't love it, and if you're not having fun doing it, you're going to give up. So welcome to another episode of Johnson's Idol Podcast, a partner of MoshPitNation.com. The guest this episode is Memphis Mayfire's own Maddie Mullins, a southern gentleman in his own right, and a not southern gentleman because he's here in the Midwest, is my co-host Mr. Daniel Terry. So I guess he has Midwest charm. How are you doing today? I think I've got all the Midwest charm. I've got the perfect Midwest dialect, which is no dialect. I sound how the people on TV sound. (laughs) <laughs> so I guess I'm doing pretty good. That's really good to hear. I uh, I think I'm still recovering from the night of this show, the night of this interview, actually. To uh, to say I, I did some drinking is, is putting it mildly. You look like uh, you might need to drink some water. Uh, Hydration is the key to drunkenness, my friend. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, the uh, next couple episodes you might hear from this night, uh, the Maddie Mullins interview, which you're going to hear in a little bit, and uh, my chat with uh, Dan Jacobs of Atreyu. What can I say? Uh, I want to, first of all, uh, a lot of this was uh, set up thanks to uh, Porter McKnight of Atreyu, uh, who kind of was like, yo, uh, you know, we got some stuff to do leading up to the show and and, us hanging out. Um, Maybe try setting up an interview with uh, somebody. So I set up this interview with Maddie, who couldn't have been more nice. uh, And especially after feeling like amateur hour doing this, because I got to the venue uh brought in the lot of alcohol that I brought for Porter and the Atreyu dudes and, and everybody else on the can- on the uh tour and uh, went downstairs for you know Atreyu's meet and greet and I think uh, Memphis Mayfires and Ice Nine Kills had just ended and so I was booting up my laptop which uh since buying my new computer my home setup I now have a nice new laptop basically that is only for doing live podcasts uh in person and it decided it did not want to load up. Something that normally takes it a minute tops to do decided to take, oh, I don't know, 35 minutes. Oh, wow. And so imagine being in a green room with a TM who I eventually realized after thinking to myself, this is a very intimidating man looking, and uh, I feel like an amateur because my shit's not working. Uh, I realized he is the, I believe, the guitar player for My Children, My Bride. <laughs> Um, finally got my stuff to work and then Maddie and I just got right into it. Um, and, uh, ended up finding out, uh, thanks to Amy, the uh, publicist for the band over at Adam Splitter, um, for setting this up. But, uh, basically ended up finding out as I was telling Corey, their, the TM, uh, I was like, oh, you probably think this is very amateur hour and probably, you know, what a waste of an interview for Maddie and his time and yours and all this kind of stuff. And just kind of trying to joke my way out of the awkward situation. And, uh, he was like, well, actually, uh. Your podcast comes pretty highly recommended um, from the publicist. Uh, spoke very highly of you. So, and I know that uh, Amy also is very uh, excited about putting Maddie and I in a room together and, and actually doing this in person. And uh, I definitely got to say, um, I've always heard really great things about Maddie as a person, uh, doing interviews and so forth. And uh, I couldn't have agreed more. The dude was super nice. And uh, yeah. It uh it was a really fun chat. A very brief, uh, like I said, because I fucked up and my computer didn't want to work. But uh, as a result, uh, did the best with what I could, and uh, I think we covered a lot of stuff. Yeah, I mean, you guys got right down to the nitty gritty about hair care products. I mean, that is a huge passion of Maddie's, and uh, having a lot of friends who cut hair uh, is sort of an omnipresent um, career field uh, where I live. The interesting thing too, uh, and I definitely want to bring this up. Um, Drinking wise, uh, I finally got to try your space dust while I was out in uh, out in Fort Wayne. Oh, you did! I did. I think I even sent you a drunk text that I ordered a whole picture of it. I just blindly you went did, into yep. it, and uh, let me tell you, everyone, Porter, uh, Atreus, man, uh, TM, uh, Bridget, were all like, "Yep, that's an IPA," and they had about half of their their glass and decided that they didn't want any more. And we all decided that we were very full and, and it was time for, to be done for the night. <laughs> we were like, shit, I've seen Dan polish off like six of these before 
<laughs> yeah. in a row. Yeah, I will say it's a it's very actually, heavy beer. It's so strong that it actually um, makes most other beers taste kind of bland. So a lot of the time, <laughs> like I can't, I can't go from drinking Space Dust to drinking something else like in the same night. Like I have to, you know, if I'm going to drink a different beer, I have to start with that. I could do it opposite. I could drink Space Dust afterwards, but not, uh, not before. Right. No, I definitely could see that. I was. It was definitely an, an interesting IPA. Um, I think I probably could have handled it better in a quantity smaller than a full pitcher. <laughs> I definitely no, felt like how, I wasted. That's how it's meant to be enjoyed. Uh, I guess I definitely felt like I wasted uh, the money on that since uh, it didn't seem to go over as well as any of the beers that I had brought. Um, it was kind <laughs> of the fun thing. Uh, I ended up bringing uh, the tour basically. Um, I, my wife and I bought about a hundred dollars worth of alcohol, and. In craft beer, that goes pretty quickly. Uh, I think it was about two 12 pack or two, yeah, two six packs. Uh, but we had everything from an oatmeal cream pie beer from uh, Mis- uh, Pigeon Hill, which is in Muskegon. Uh, they use like 20 pounds of marshmallow fluff uh, per batch. So oh, nice. it has a really nice oatmeal cream pie uh, flavor to it. Uh, we brought a cinnamon roll beer from uh, Southern Tier, which I know is not Michigan, but it just sounded good, so I got it. Um, there was a – what else did we get? We got the Note of Your Business from Grand Armory, which is a, a – like, I think I talked about that previously. Um, mm-hmm. The Elk Brewing PB and Jelly. It's a peanut butter and jelly ale. Um, it's super delicious. I didn't get to see anyone drink that. But uh, almost all the beers, we did an all-Michigan beer and liquor uh, thing. We ended up going to – I brought one of my favorite whiskeys, which is uh, Grand Traverse – or it's Traverse City Whiskey Company, but it's their uh, cherry – whiskey made from uh traverse city cherries uh so mm-hmm. it's very delicious uh that seemed to be a very big hit uh and then my wife uh is more of the vodka drinker i was told that a lot of the tour likes vodka so um the vodka went over pretty well uh even had a vodka with Lacroix, which i've never had a Lacroix before mm-hmm. uh it wasn't bad but i imagine that Lacroix by itself is not so good i have never had Lacroix though yeah, and I hadn't either. I don't know that I ever will. I don't know that I will ever use it for anything because of all like the, the LaCroix tastes like if someone across the room shouted out lime and you're like, yeah, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> sure, man. Um, but uh, currently, uh, something I found while I was at the show uh, that I was enjoying was uh, they didn't have any ginger beer. And uh, I just kind of wanted a, a gin and ginger beer. They didn't have any. So I asked if they had ginger ale. Hmm. So I have a gin and ginger ale, so like a very, very poor man's mule. Yeah, yeah. But it works. Yeah, hey, whatever you need. What have you... I'm, uh, drinking, I'm drinking water right now, but uh, the last time I was at Discography Discussion Studios, I found three or four more uh, knot holes uh, <laughs> by uh, Logboat. You, you'll hear me uh, talk about Logboat a lot because... They're local. They're local here in St. Louis, and they always have a amazing. Like every time, every time I go to buy beer, they have a new one out. So they've had they had Knot Hole, uh, which was again described as tasting like candy, more or less. <laughs> and uh, then they had uh, they've got one called Mammoth, which is it's got a big picture of a mammoth on it, and I can read. It doesn't say mammoth. It actually says Mammoth, <laughs> and uh, it's a. Uh, it's just like an American style lager. It's only like four percent, so like you have to drink a lot of. If your goal is to get drunk, don't drink Mammut. Um, but it's, it's just a nice like dinner beer. It's perfect. And speaking of perfect, I think this is a perfect spot to get into my conversation with Mister Maddie Mullins of Memphis Fire, and we will talk to you afterwards. <laughs> So I have the pleasure this early evening of talking to Maddie Mullins, vocalist for Memphis Mayfire, who have a new album out, Broken. It's about three weeks old now. How are you doing uh, this early evening? Doing good, man. Stoked about the show tonight. 
Ah, I'm pretty excited too. I, I love this venue. I've only been here one other time to see uh, Gojira and Mastodon, but the the vibe of this room is really cool. Like good sight lines everywhere. Yeah, man. I thought when I walked in at first, it looked familiar. I thought we'd played here before, but I guess we haven't. We were just in this city with Seven Dust on that tour, but we did like an outdoor festival with them. Oh, okay. Um, so we definitely didn't play this room, but the inside of it. I don't know. Maybe it just has a familiar vibe. But yeah, I'm stoked. <laughs> I'm sure these rooms all start to look the same after a little while for you guys. Sometimes, yeah, some of them. Um, so you know, I kind of speaking of the new record, I really wanted to kind of say like I've really kind of been digging the the progression of of the band's quote unquote sound. What Thank you, you, who you are as a band, and you know, I kind of had wondered if the the direction you kind of went on the last record, the uh, this light this light I hold, if I guess the success of that, or just kind of the the playing those songs kind of made you more comfortable in being more of a singer at this point, not like, you know, a screamer and kind of expanding on your range and what you can do. Totally. Yeah, man. I think it's been kind of a slow progression up until this point. We've always, you know, with every record added more songs that were more melodic. And then with this one fully intended on going in and writing a rock record through and through. Uh, we did this record with a different producer than we've ever worked with before. His name's Kane Churko. Mm -hmm. Him and his dad are responsible for all the Disturbed and Five Finger Death Punch <laughs> and Ozzy Osbourne and all like the big active rock stuff, you know. Uh, so we wanted to work with him and write a rock record. Uh, we had Drew Folk mix the record, who's never mixed a Memphis record before. And so it was just kind of like an experimental season for us. It was us trying something new and seeing what we were capable of and uh, just being stoked. You know, I kind of was leading up to the... <laughs> we're closing a door so that way the background noise will go away. Um, you know, it was kind of interesting lyrically when listening to the record because a lot of times when preparing for these and just, you know, in taking in all the, the music... It's kind of hard to look at the phone and see the song titles and so forth, but, you know, it really kind of gives me more of a sense of the record because I'm just kind of void of any distractions other than the music. And so when listening to it, especially kind of the second half of the record, you know, songs like Me and You or You and Me um, and so forth, I feel like there's lyrically a sense of like a, a relationship kind of coming to an end. Yeah. And it felt to me, and maybe this is just me as a listener putting maybe something of my own into it, but like loss of a, a relationship, like a, almost like a marriage. Mm -hmm. uh, it felt like being betrayed by somebody. Totally. And I know that that relates to a lot of relationships outside of a marriage or whatever, but because of your openness in interviews talking about, you know, I think you're one of the few people that have, you know, married your high school sweetheart and have been around and, you know, kind of one of those relationships that I think a lot of people should uh, admire because of the adversities that it takes to be in a committed relationship, especially with the stresses that being just in life, but like being in a touring musician can like afford the relationship. So totally. What was the catalyst for the for the lyrical content of this record. Yeah, um, well, rest assured, it's not about my wife. No, I figured that out from um, an Instagram yeah. <laughs> post very recently. <laughs> yeah, my, my marriage doesn't make for great song, uh, sad songs. Um, but yeah, man, um, uh, it's about a lot of different marriages that I've observed recently. Um, you know, uh, my own parents, mm -hmm. you know, um, I have siblings that have gone through divorce, close friends that have gone through divorce, important divorce, you know, not just ignorant divorce, but I, you know, I wanted that song to be, um, an anthem for anybody that feels stuck in a relationship that they know they're not, they shouldn't be in. You know, I think a lot of times people can, can get comfortable in a relationship that's not healthy or walk back to a relationship just because they're afraid to look elsewhere, you know, to find love. And, um, I was really hoping that that song would encourage people to get up and move on mm -hmm. from a relationship that they know is poisonous or that they know they shouldn't be in. Um, and so, yeah, not, not about me, but uh, still very close to my heart because of a lot of what I've seen. Yeah, no, it definitely resonates. And I think that's something I've kind of noticed throughout your, your history in the band and lyrically is you always kind of seem to be able to find everyday things that are obviously very personal to you, but kind of, I was not dumbing down because that's that makes it sound bad but like just kind of uh, articulated in a way that it makes it to where it can apply to anything totally um, yeah not like i said i took it and i think maybe it's because like my wedding anniversary is coming up in a couple of weeks sure and so like marriage has kind of been on my mind and like totally. friends are getting married and so forth so like when listening to this it's like oh man like this is kind of a, a really raw and sincere thing that i feel like as a as a you know, mid 30 something now where I feel like it's like you're articulating something that, you know, like I've watched people go through. I've kind of very much like yourself gone through an experience. So it was like, man, like, you know, like I know you've talked so much about your, your relationship. So I wasn't sure if it was about yours. And I was like, it's kind of 
really interesting to see how honest if it was about your marriage about how honest you were with it and i was like you know i don't think a lot of people would go that route yeah yeah well you know the record is called broken uh because the common thread throughout the whole record is that we are all broken people Mm -hmm. right um regardless of of what it is that makes us broken life is simply imperfect you know so everybody in their own way is broken in one way or another and with previous records with our last two records specifically um you know i've been really focused on just writing about uh hope and the light at the end of the tunnel and um i felt like i was doing a disservice to our fans if i wasn't writing about those things because so many people would come up and talk to me and say hey you know like i struggle with this i struggle with that you know like i've been down things haven't been working out so i wanted our music to be this beacon of hope but before we started writing this record, the thing that dawned on me was that when I was at my worst with anxiety and depression, it would never make it better if someone came and patted me on the back and said, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get better or it's right. going to be okay. The only time I would ever feel any relief is when I would talk to somebody who was struggling and realize that I wasn't alone in that. Right. You know, uh, it was important for me to write songs that don't necessarily sound hopeful up front, but become a song that somebody can relate to so that their healing process can start Right. to, to understand that you're not alone in your brokenness, to understand that there's beauty in the brokenness that you can, when you do get through something, you're going to be a stronger version of yourself that's capable of more. And, um, so that's, that's the thread throughout this whole record. And yeah, that song is very much a, a part of that thread. Reminds me of the uh, line from uh, Fra Fra I was like, Oh, beauty in the breakdown. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Totally. Um, you know, kind of speaking to the the last two records, um, you know, the video for, uh, shit, what is it, Only Me? The Old Me? The Old Me, sorry. Again, the whole not looking at song things. It's okay. It's been kind of interesting looking at those two videos for that and uh, this this light I hold. It's, they're very cinematic. Yeah. Um, and, you know, in this day and age, I feel like a lot of bands, especially when, you know, it's not, it's not cost efficient to make very big budget uh, videos yeah, anymore. Yeah, totally. But the thing that I thought was kind of interesting as I'm watching these videos, and they're very centric, centered around you storyline-wise and so forth, is is acting something that you have wanted to pursue, especially with the new video being basically you in both roles and, and some of the acting you have to do. Yeah, I mean, um, I love acting, in, in, in music videos at least. I don't know what it would be like to do TV or, or movies. but um, And every time that I do a video with Caleb, he's always like, man, you could really do this you know, on the side. And I was just... I guess I don't believe him. I've never thought of myself as an actor. Definitely have never <laughs> thought of myself as an actor or someone that's capable of playing like a genuine cinematic role. Um, but when it comes to my songs and creating a cinematic experience for the lyrics that I've written, I feel like I kind of fit into that pocket, you know? So, um, you know, Caleb did that video. He did the this Loud I Hold video. He did our video for Virus that was also very cinematic. Mm-hmm. Um, and we love that um, that vibe for, for music videos. I think it takes people on a journey. And you're totally right about the, the budget. We go into music videos these days knowing that we're not going to recoup it, that mm-hmm. there's no way that we're going to be able to get enough views to, to recoup what, what it costs to make that video. But, um, but we like to have those videos, um, you know, coming out with a new record, coming out swinging, just being like, you know, this is, this is a single and we take it very seriously. You know, like we, we put a lot into this video. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, I'm pretty, I'm pretty stoked about how it turned out. Yeah. How hands-on have you been with the treatments for both of the videos? Like, were they come? Did they come from you, or was it a collaboration with Caleb? Or our treatments are always a collaboration between me and Caleb. Especially like "Stay the Course" was the first video he ever did for us, mm-hmm. and he sent over something, and I was just like, "Man, like none of that is really." Um, it's all cool, but none of that is really in line with who I am as a person. So we went back and forth on it until I was really comfortable with it. And he, in, the, in that moment, he really understood like what I was trying to accomplish. And he understood me as a lyricist more. So with every video we've done since then, I've been less and less involved with the treatments because when he sends it over, it's usually almost perfect. What uh, what was the most challenging part of playing two dual ro- roles in a, uh, in a video? Um, so they actually had, I actually had two stunt doubles, mm-hmm. um, and they flew out like the fight coordinator from all the Fast and the Furious movies to like show me how to fight <laughs> on film. It was really cool. Um, but the most difficult part about that video shoot was the weather. We shot in Santa Clarita, and we shot all night long, mm-hmm. um, and it was terribly cold out in the desert um, out there. So um, we were, you know, it was like 25, 30 degrees, and we were, um, you know, staying outside. Uh, videos are a lot of, like, hurry up and wait. Oh, yeah. So, like, we'd go on set, and I would stand there for an hour before they were ready for one shot that would take three minutes, you know? Um, <laughs> but also just, you know, kind of going back and forth between um, – I had to do a couple wardrobe changes where I was um, – 
covered in blood Mm -hmm. and then go back to clean Maddie and then go back to being covered in blood. And with every Warbo change, our our makeup artist was putting prosthetic like uh, wounds on my skin and stuff like that, which is very time consuming. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was probably the most challenging role. Um, I'm pretty good at, I guess, like when they say action, like I can play whatever character you want me to play. If it's angry, if it's, you know, genuine, if it's, you know, uh, concerned. Um, I know how I make those facial features in real life. So I kind of just recreate that, you know. Uh, but, it, dude, I love doing this. It's so much fun. Um, kind of switching gears a little bit and something maybe you don't get to talk about uh, a whole lot during these is uh, your palm made company. Yeah, sure. On point. Yeah. You know, having talked to, like, James Hart and Kevin from Old Wounds and people that are hairstylists by yeah. trade now. Oh, I love James. What uh, what made you want to get into this this space? Well, I've always been passionate about men's grooming, especially my own hair. Just been kind of OCD about it, like, my whole <laughs> life, you know? Um, even when I was in middle school, you know, like, I would, like, grab all my mom's hair products and, like, mess with my hair for, like, an hour before I went to school. And, um, <laughs> you know, uh, just like anybody else, I was uh, I had gotten into starting – to use like American crew and like grocery store bought hair products and stuff like that. Um, and when I was on warp tour in 2012, somebody brought out a can of hair product that I'd never heard of before. And I was like, well, what's this? And I tried it and I was like, Whoa, this is way better than anything I've ever used. And because of that, you know, it sparked my interest in looking into all these different underground grooming products and stuff. You can only get at really a barbershop, Mm -hmm. um, not at a grocery store. And found all these different products I loved, but the more I dove into it, the more I realized what the potential was for a product and that I hadn't found it in any single product. I haven't found the perfect product. So um, I was in Hawaii for a friend's wedding and I met a guy um, who became my business partner. He kind of works in that world of product development and um, teamed me up with a scientist in Oregon and we went back and forth on basically reverse engineering all my favorite pomades, figuring out like what chemically speaking made up like my favorite aspects of um, those pomades and then created mine from all my favorite you know, different aspects of, of everything else, you know? And so, uh, you know, I wanted it to hold like this. I wanted it to smell like this. I wanted it to comb through like this. I wanted it to set like this. I wanted it to, you know, feel like this in the hands and wash off like this, you know? And, um, we spent two years Mm -hmm. developing the product, uh, the original one. And, um, we went through 57 versions and, uh, on the 57th version, I was like, yeah, this is it. And, um, I was so proud of it. You know, I think that, um, it's a, it's a little different than, than maybe what other people in the industry have done as far as, uh, you know, um, a product that they offer, you know? And so um, it's something I'm really proud of. We have three products now. We have the, the original pomade, which is kind of like a, a high shine, stronghold, classic pomade for like pompadours and stuff like that. Uh, we have a matte pomade that's more of a natural finish, texturizing product mm-hmm. for people that like something a little more natural. And then we just launched a beard oil as well okay. um, that I'm super excited about. But anytime we do something new, I always spend a long time on it. I'm a perfectionist and I like something to be perfect before it gets out into the world you know um so yeah very proud of that company very excited about the future um i think we're just going to continue to expand maybe do a shampoo do a cologne um you know do potentially like a a, yeah body wash a tattoo lotion uh, that's like you know that has spf in it so it protects your tattoos from the sun but also moisturizes um have a lot of different ideas like that so we'll see what a you know because what's interesting and kind of like talking to a lot of different people who are in different different realms like that it's like you know like i come from more of a retail food management kind of yeah. space um so a lot of times when it comes to like business things like i kind of get really excited because like i'm a numbers guy like give me numbers totally. and all that stuff like i get it and so it's always kind of interesting is just thinking about like how competitive like a space like a, you know a, a hairstyle or sorry not hairstylist but a like any kind of makeup product or things like that. Like there's so many SKUs, there's so much competition trying to get any shelf space and so forth. And so, you know, when I was kind of thinking about leading up to this interview and wanting to talk to you about that, because it's more of another business, because I think something that I don't think a lot of people realize, and I just had this conversation with someone the other day is, you know, you guys got into a band because you wanted, you were passionate about music, totally. but you didn't realize that you also had to be an accountant, a merch person, yeah. a, you know, all the other business sides oh of this gosh, stuff. Yeah. And so as a result, it's like in, you just being passionate about wanting to do hair stuff like you know pomades or whatever did you realize like how hard it was going to be to break into this i had no idea (laughs) that's why it took two years to develop that original formula i mean during that process we were building out like you know the foundation of the company and how it was going to work and who was going to handle logistics and who was doing shipping and you know how we were going to you know handle customer service and and all these kind of things and it was chaos just like trying to 
put all, put everything in place and and figure out how to be like a well-oiled machine because mm -hmm. we knew that when we launched the product that there was a good chance it was going to do well you know um and so yeah it was it was crazy uh but now like looking back on it i've learned so much from the process um that i'm, I'm so thankful that it was hard i'm thankful that you know it took there was a huge learning curve because now i have so much i can offer any of my friends that want to start businesses and and help them through that you know do you have any aspirations to to actually learn how to be a hairstylist at all, or does it only go to like the like the apparel side of it? So if to speak? we ever had, um, you know, like I'm a barbershop fanatic. Like mm -hmm. I go to. Well, I saw you guys went to Detroit last night and get a. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Up, so. I mean, when I'm on the road, I'll get cut almost once every four days. Okay. Um, and uh, so I love that. I love that trade. I love that culture. And so um, if we ever had like an extensive, like a year off or something like that, I would probably go to barber school. Uh, not to pursue it as a career, but to know the trade even more, uh, to appreciate the trade even more. And uh, I, I'm just, I, I love it. And I've got so many friends that are incredible barbers, you know? Um, so yeah, definitely. I, I love every aspect of it. At the very least, would you think about probably opening up your own barber shop? Potentially down the road. That is something that I've thought about doing, yeah. Um, and I've got friends that own barber shops and friends that would like to go in on something like that with me too, you know. Uh, so it could be a cool thing. Um, I just want to make sure that what I do, I always have enough time to devote to it. I never want to do anything, you know, um, not at the best, you know, ability that I can. So um, if I was to do that, I would want to be really hands-on with it and I'd want to make sure that I could, you know, guarantee the success of it. Kind of in wrapping up, you know, you're. We were talking before we started rolling uh, that basically you're only playing one song off of the new record just because it's a 45 minute set. You got six records. Um, I would assume in the next year you're probably going to be touring pretty heavily. Yeah. What are some of the songs that you're most looking forward to getting out in the live debut? You know, uh, I think that the second radio single is going to be Heavy as the Weight. Okay. Uh, so I think that'll be a cool song to add into the set list. But I think on the record, there's, you know, there's songs that are definitely aimed at radio and there's songs that are aimed at live. Yeah. Um, I think Watch Out would be a really fun one to do live. Yeah. Um, I also think that um, um, Who I Am would be a really fun one to do live. Uh, kind of bouncier and, and uh, kind of a crowd mover. Speaking to the... Uh heavy as the weight who would in a live setting would you just have the guest vocal would you end up doing that i'd probably or? wrap it yeah okay yeah, i've practiced it because and... i i was kind of wondering how that's gone over from your fans like when the record dropped because like it caught me off guard i was like oh this is an interesting section like musically it changed so i was like this is in my head i go this is typically where you would almost have like oh there's the guest vocal <laughs> totally yeah totally so it's it's definitely out of the pocket of anything that we've ever done um but I was so stoked about yeah. that. Um, huge fan of Andy Mino's work and also wanted a guest vocalist that people didn't expect. So um, I'm super stoked about it, and, and I would definitely attempt at least attempt to do it live. <laughs> who, would, uh, who would be someone that you'd like to collaborate with that people wouldn't expect sort of like that maybe in the future? Um, you know, I've always wanted to collab with Christian from Blindside, their oh singer. Oh, my God, I love um, that band. Huge, huge Blindside fan. So. Yeah. My bad. <laughs> That's fine. Um, you know, but th so that would be cool. Um, I don't know if there's any other ones necessarily that are like super unexpected. Um, you know, me and Post Malone have talked about collabing. Um, that would be cool, but obviously he's the busiest person in the world. <laughs> it sounds I like think, you are too, though. <laughs> yeah, it would, it would be pretty. It would be pretty tough to make it happen, but you know, at some point, I think that would be really awesome. Yeah, that would be really sweet. I mean, he comes from Post. That is comes from this world. He does. Yeah, so. yeah, big Memphis fan. So yeah, that'd be cool. That'd be great. Uh, Lastly, I always like to have the person plug your socials. Where can people find you and the band? Totally. Yeah, my personal socials, uh, pretty much just anything slash Maddie Mullins, Instagram. Facebook is actually Maddie M U L L S. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, Twitter is the same thing. The band is just at Memphis Mayfire on everything. Um, hair product company is called On Point Pomade. If you want to find that, um, you can find that online anywhere as well. And then I always like to end these out to a song. So what would you like us to end it out to? Doesn't even have to be yours. Dang. Let's if you're just like feeling something in the on the rides. Let's do Silence, Blindside. Oh, my God. I love that song. All right. Awesome. Thank you very much, man. Of course, man. So that was my conversation with a smooth voice, Mr. Matty Mullins of Memphis Mayfire. Dan, what did you think of that? Good chat. You weren't quite drunk yet. <laughs> uh, I, to be, f <laughs> to be fair, I didn't, I had a sip of uh, booze uh, during my chat with Dan, thanks to uh, Porter bringing some whiskey over. Uh, but I specifically made it a point not to drink before I did these interviews because I didn't want – I knew I'd potentially be hanging out with these people and I didn't want to be a shit show <laughs> in front of them yet. <laughs> That's hilarious.
<laughs> uh, yeah, that way you don't sound like me. I'm just like, hey, let's talk about some stuff. You know, <laughs> I've definitely done I've definitely done those interviews before, and uh, I've been on. They're a good time. Like, at least I remember them. I remember them being a good time. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, it's probably a probably a smart move on your part. Yeah, yeah, you know, get the work done. It's kind of like the Kevin Smith philosophy, you know, like if you're going to do something, you know, he he wakes and bakes and smokes a lot of weed and all that shit. But, uh, you know, he's always like, you know, I'm, if I smoke or if I do this thing, then I have to be productive. So, I mean, all goes back to the kind of handle your fucking high mantra they have on one of the other podcasts he does. But uh, my thing is, is always been, you know, you can drink, but don't let it become like it was on the Asley Dying episode with you or... I just start telling stories that have no no need to even be mentioned because I don't finish them, and it just is bad. I don't know. That was pretty entertaining. I'm like, well, and then moving on to this, and then you're all like, Ike Turner, motherfucker! <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, if you want to hear an epic, epic, like, I think we went longer than Joe Rogan on that one. I think we went longer than Adelaide Dying's discography. Uh, yeah, I'll have, to tie, I'll have to look that up. See, look, put it all on a playlist and see. Oh, you, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, <laughs> it was bad. Uh, that one, that was definitely a learning experience of uh, how not to podcast. <laughs> a ringing endorsement from John Beatty. <laughs> uh, I mean, the fact that you said how many people you've said have listened to it just baffles me. It's entertaining. Whether it's good or bad, it's one of those, like, if you're listening to it and you're like, this isn't as bad as they say it is, then, you know, thank you. But uh, if you're listening to it because it's a train wreck and you can't look away, thank you. <laughs> I I would like to say, if you go over to that episode, uh, it's the Esley Dying episode over on Discography Discussion, Dan's other podcast. Uh, it was my first time ever doing one. And I didn't quite know the format, so, like, I didn't realize that they don't really deep dive really into the records. It's just kind of more of a quote-unquote rational gaze. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, there's just not enough time most of the time to, to go super deep. Because, I mean, we could be like, we could be like Roach Coach and, and go, you song. know, yeah, an entire, an entire uh, episode dedicated to one album, which is actually really smart. We're going to run out of content faster than they are. I don't know, man. But no, so I mean, like, it, it was kind of fun to do in this chat. Um, Memphis Mayfire, admittedly, uh, not really a band that like I have been listening to for a long time. They're kind of, and Dan and I have had this conversation quite a bit, actually. Uh, bands that kind of either, uh, you know, I know music is kind of timeless as a whole. You know, like, it, it, it's not a certain age that any of it should be like, oh, well, this band is for people of this age to this age. Um, but I definitely will say that a band like Memphis Mayfire, even though, you know, they're six albums in, I believe now, they just kind of were that band that like came when I was kind of not as immersed in the metalcore scene as I am currently, uh, or as I was when I was a younger kid, uh, who had a disposable income to go see, uh, bands and so forth all the time. And so, and that's totally on me. I understand that. You know, I'm, I'm kind of stuck in my ways of being like, oh, I, I like Atreyu. I like Deftones. Like, I still listen to the same bands I was listening to in high school. And, you know, it wasn't until my wife actually kind of got into this new record, Broken, where she's like, I don't remember liking this band. And then I started listening to the record. And I was like, this is definitely a step in a direction where I would like the band more if they did more of this. Because I'm more of a, a sucker for hooks in my, my metal. And Maddie's got a great singing voice, and I think on the new record he really showcases that. And the lyrics are kind of very, uh, a lot more mature. Um, and I think because of the singing, you can understand that a lot more, and the music, the musicality of it, uh, comes across a lot more, and and the the weight of the songs. Um, so this record is really one that kind of found me and kind of caught me by surprise because I just kind of was labeling them like you know just a, a somewhat generic metal chord band of the new for the newer kids yeah i always thought they had a little kind of a little something special going on um just in the just in the sense of of, of melody and being able to have hooks you know i mean obviously in the beginning they didn't as much but you know um there's a lot of maturity in their new material for sure yeah no most definitely i would uh i would definitely agree with that and you know i was kind of surprised uh when i when i kind of mentioned you know, there's a song on here with a uh, a rapper that's on the 
one of the tracks, Heavy is the Weight. And, you know, I was kind of surprised when he was like, oh, yeah, you know, uh, I think I could do that part live. And I was like, ooh. I wasn't sure how the fans would react to that part as a whole, but to hear Maddie do that in a live setting, I think would be really interesting and see if maybe even that opens up another avenue for him and his band to maybe go down that route with Maddie doing it as opposed to a guest vocalist. Yeah, that'd be interesting for sure. And getting post Malone. Time would have to tell. Yeah. How would you feel about a post Malone Memphis Mayfire collab? Hey, I think it's um. I think it would sound how it would sound. I don't have an opinion just yet. The thing is, is that stuff sounds really good on paper, but I've heard collaborations before that I've been like, mm. but it seems like it would be cool. I was going to say, like, that's the- right. That's the world's most non-committal answer. <laughs> that was going to say something about uh loud rocks or whatever the fuck, the loud, the hard and heavy compilation. Oh, Jesus Christ. Yeah. <laughs> Forced mashups. Ooh. But then there's the example of like judgment night where it totally works. Oh yeah, well, Judgment Night was cool, <laughs> and I would know that. I, I would only, I would only, I only know anything about those compilations because I listened to the Roach Coach episodes on them. I, they were definitely not something I was rocking in in, in high school. Oh man, those soundtracks were totally up my alley. Uh, judgment Night was a way better soundtrack than it was a movie. Same with Demon Night. Same with ah, Queen of the Damned was actually a pretty good. Uh, actually, no, I take it back. It's a pretty shit movie, as far as a real movie goes, but for what it is and all that and the soundtrack, the soundtrack definitely outshines the movie. Yeah. I like queen of the damned. And, uh, I also liked the Freddy versus Jason soundtrack as well. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we'll have to do something on movie soundtracks. We should. But yeah, um, kind of in wrapping up, um, you know, this episode was kind of short, so, uh, it feels kind of right just to kind of keep everything, uh, in line with that for, for this episode. But, uh, again, thank you to, uh, Maddie Mullins. Thank you to Amy from Adam Splitter for helping me get this interview set up. Thank you to Porter for the solid hangs. I'm probably going to thank you again in the Dan Jacobs episode because you're technically on it. And, uh... Yeah, if you guys want to go check out Memphis Mayfire's new record, Broken, it's out now. Uh, it's really good. Uh, I'm sure they have a lot of touring to do. Uh, they are just about wrapping up the In Our Wake tour, which is growing on currently. Uh, most of the leftover dates, uh, they're hitting the West Coast as of now. Most of the dates are uh, close to selling out or sold out. So if you live out on the West Coast and you are interested in going, go. Because uh, first and foremost, I got to say, Every band really had it, and this is probably one of the most stacked tours of this kind I've seen in a very long time. It actually really reminded me of the Curse tour uh, that I saw, which had a, a, a then up and coming on Earth. Uh, there was Scars on Broadway, if anyone remembers that band. Um, there's somebody else on that tour I can't remember, but like everybody was kind of the the up and coming band. And I definitely have to say, I'm not the biggest Ice Nine Kills fan, and holy fuck you can tell that that is a band that is just like firing on all cylinders right now the crowd sang along to damn near every song off of the new record which has only been out maybe a month three weeks um it was incredible uh memphis mayfire put on a hell of a show people were definitely loving that band and if you think Atreyu is the old dog that doesn't have any new tricks and no one really cares about them anymore, uh, you will be sadly mistaken to find out that a lot of people give a shit about that band still, and their songs still fucking sound great live. The band still puts on a great show, and uh, time has been very good to all of those those gentlemen. Um, I think they look better now than they did uh, back in <laughs> back in '08. <laughs> Somehow, I definitely did not feel that way when I went and saw Cannibal Corpse the other night. Well. Those dudes are starting to look kind of rough. Er, rough er. Metalcore keeps you young, I guess. I guess so. It's those clean choruses, man. It's like a palate cleanser. Yeah, I guess. The saccharine vocals. Um, so yeah, uh, speaking of the tour though, if you'd like to keep up with that, keep up with the tour, uh, keep up with Maddie, Memphis Mayfire, you can find Memphis Mayfire real easily on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Memphis Mayfire. Uh, Maddie Mullins, just find him on Twitter and Instagram at Maddie Mullins. Uh, there is the weird thing on Facebook, something about it being like M L U M U L L E N S or something like that. It was spelled wrong, but, um, I don't know if you find him on there, follow him there. And, uh, Dan, where can people follow you? Uh, you can follow me on Facebook under Daniel Terry. You can follow me 
on Twitter at Discuss Metal Dan. And if you would like to keep up with all things the podcast, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Johnson Title Podcast. Tweet at us at Johnson Title Pod. Email us at Johnson Title Pod at gmail.com. And if you would like to keep up with our show partners at MoshPitNation.com, go there. Read uh, the latest reviews, interviews uh, over on that website. You can even find some of the writing and interviews I've done with uh, T.J. Miller of Still Remains, uh, who is also a guest on this. Uh, and they are actually – he's a part of a refused tribute set happening this Friday as of the time we're recording. So looking forward to seeing what T.J. can do with uh, some refused doing all of The Shape of Punk to come. Um that aside, you can also find Moshpit Nation on Facebook at Moshpit Nation West Capital MI. Twitter and Instagram are simply Moshpit Nation. And you can find our show sponsor, The Bean Bastard, at TheBeanBastard.com to get you some delicious roasted coffee. Bean Bastard on Facebook and Instagram. And we're going to end this episode as we always do with a song. And as you heard Maddie pick, he had an excellent choice. He wants us to play it out to Silence by Blindside. The title track off of that record. What a phenomenal record it is. That needs to come out on vinyl very soon. Absolutely. And we will talk to you guys next time.